Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Isabel Crombie, and I'm the Assistant Director here at the National Gallery of Victoria. And on behalf of the NGV trustees, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event's taking place, the people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. So I am very excited to be welcoming you to this extremely special event. I can hardly believe our good fortune in having both Jeff Wall and Thomas Demand with us tonight. I think I'm right in saying that they have never been in conversation like this before, so um, who knows what's going to happen. This conversation is, of course, a way of leading us into considering their exceptional exhibitions, which are being held here at the National Gallery of Victoria over summer. And we do thank them very warmly for making the long trip to Australia and for agreeing to be part of this conversation tonight. As I'm sure all of you here tonight know, and I think the fact that so many of you have turned up to this conversation know, Jeff Wool and Thomas Demand are amongst the most important artists of our time. Jeff Wool's photographs have rewritten nearly every convention of photography, and his outstanding body of work was decisive in establishing the medium as the major contemporary art form that it is today. Thomas Demand has a unique style that subverts our understanding of reality and fiction. His photographs draw attention to how we engage with the media and modern technology. So hosting tonight's conversation is one of Australia's best known radio and television presenters, Fenella Kernerbone. Fenella has presented and hosted some of Australia's much loved arts programs on television and radio, including Art Nation, Sunday Arts, Movie Show, Sound Lab, and By Design. And she is perfectly suited to lead this conversation. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Jeff Wall, Thomas Demand, and Fenella Kernerbone. Um, thank you very much, Isabel. That was very kind of you. You make it sound like I get around quite a lot. Um, which is kind of true. Um, I want to do another round of applause for Jeff Wall and Thomas Demand. It's so wonderful to have them on stage here in Melbourne and so great to see all of you guys here. Thank you. Um, I was actually just watching the two of you interact before and, and chat and I wondered, you hadn't actually met pr prior to coming to Australia, is that right, Jeff? No, no, we know each other yeah, for okay. some, I don't know, time. Some time. And how's it been going uh, in, in, in Melbourne? You've been getting around, seeing the sights? How's it been going between Thomas and me? Is, <laughs> yes. is it a romance? <laughs> no, I haven't been getting around seeing anything. Just putting it up. Okay. Um, well, the, the, exhibition <laughs> the exhibition is opening in a couple of days' time of Jeff's work and also of Thomas's work as well. Um, and, and Jeff, if I could begin with you, because this, you described it to me just before as this exhibition of your work as being like a mini survey. Uh, and it, it crosses your career from uh, The Destroyed Room, 1978, through to, um, you know, The Recent Boy Falls from a Tree from, from 2010. So how do you select the works for something like this? What kind of choices did you make? Um, Gary Dufour curated the show. He made the choices, not really, not me really. I mean, I, I think a curator is the person who makes an exhibition. And of course, Gary and I discussed it for some time. And, and also, we've known each other for 30 years. So he's a person who knows my work inside and out, I think. He's, and he's very knowledgeable about it. So, you know, he made, essentially made the selections. We had one, a couple of issues uh, to deal with. First of all, since Australia is so curiously positioned on the globe, <laughs> where it's far from everywhere, it's expensive to bring artworks here. So we had some practical boundaries. And that meant the exhibition could only be a certain size. And that meant that in order for it to be a kind of a survey, it had to be a, a kind of a sampling um, of work that seemed to be representative of different things I'd done over time. Not very exhaustive, but hopefully well selected so that the pictures that are here are kind of salient um, as examples. So it is, I think, a good sense of, gives a good sense of what I've done, but of course there are, it's very selective. There are things that we miss out as well. Thomas, similarly, your exhibition, I was, I was watching you before, just, just an hour ago, 
sorting out the exhibition and still very much involved in the, in, in the hang of the exhibition. And, and it is also a survey of, of your career in art. It, it spans 96 to 2012. And I think it came from a, an exhibition that you did in, in Tokyo as well earlier this year. So similarly, how, how did you come to select the works in, in this show? Basically, this is, the, this is a sibling of the show in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, many of the things, I, I, many of the works I have, I, I cannot count on the, on the background being, you know, known to a Jap average Japanese visit visitor to a museum. And so we made a selection which, of things which kind of will meet them on another level than the mediated, pre-configured kind of, you know, knowledge of things. And so um, when we brought it here, we kind of had to make it a little smaller, but I wanted to keep the spirit of the show. And it's kind of very open to, yeah, it's, you know, some of the, some of the background images are so obscure that it wouldn't even make any sense to explain it anyway. So in this sense, this is a, a quite a, quite an easy, accessible show without a big, a big context in the, end, in the back. When, when you're directing your own show such as this and actually being involved in, in the hang of it as well, do you step outside of yourself as, as the artist? Do you, be, do you become a curator of your own work in some sense? No, I have to say that you know, curators are very, very helpful and support, supportive kind of institutions within uh, institution. So, <clears throat> no, it's it's more like um, I think I think a show has to be something which you remember for an outstanding kind of constellation of the works. You know, it's just like I hate shows which just you wrap up in a box and then they go to the next one and then the next one. So, in a sense, it always has to. If you really make the effort to make something, you know, coming over like all the way here, for instance, or like all the way to Tokyo or whatever, then and then the visitor makes all the you know the, the effort to come from home and they could go shopping or something, then I think it's, it, should be so, it should be a very specific choice and constellation and probably experience where you start, where you go, where you leave, and, and, I, you know, and, and that's what I'm trying to achieve. Do you, do you agree, Jeff? I love, I love this idea of a constellation. Uh, exhibitions almost always take place in rooms, essentially, boiled down to a, a number of rooms in a building uh, in which, in this case, pictures are going to be grouped together. And aside from the fact that you need to, you know, select pictures that tell something about your career, let's say, what's most fascinating to me is to make rooms in which an ensemble of images looks exciting somehow. Yeah, and they communicate to each other, and they kind of build themselves up, and you have, an, you know, that, that kind of... Because we, we see our work only, like, we see one at a time or two at a time in the studio, and the, and the, and the show, it's only a show, is also to see them speak to each other. So, sorry to interrupt, but, like, speak to each other without you being, you know, it's the day out work. there. So. Yeah, I like the, I like the fact that... Um, I make my pictures in a very solitary way, in a sense, that each one is, is, is itself. It isn't part of a series. I don't think you, I mean, you do essentially the same thing. They're very s isolated, in a way. And um, because I couldn't have too many pictures here, uh, Gary and I tried to make a virtue out of that by using the relation between the number of pictures and their size and the size of the rooms available, both in Perth and here, and probably in Sydney as well, to put some space between the pictures so that the show, as you'll see, is fairly spread out. And there's space between my pictures. And I like this very much. It's, I think, part of the show. And I, I don't think your show is very different on that score. The solitude of the picture is, to me, a part of the subject of the exhibition. Because I think what Thomas does and what I do both is a kind of tableau photography in that the photograph is not a part of a series. It's not necessarily related to another photograph, except that it's done by the same person. And if there are echoes between them, they might have occurred unconsciously, and they might not even have surfaced until a picture was made much later than another one, and then you see something that comes back. But when they're in that one But moment. when they come together, mm. th these things begin to come alive, that's, that's exciting to see, it makes you feel you know, like you've done something, <laughs> uh, finally. And I think that building of ensembles <laughs> is, uh, is one of the pleasures that I get, and I think that my impression is that people who see shows like that. It's like seeing a bouquet of flowers or something and just experiencing the different colors 
different flowers, different scents, let's say. Um, that's sort of what an exhibition can do. Mm. I keep on writing down words that you're saying, bouquet, ensemble, they're all, they're all great words. Um, when, when you were mentioning, though, the, the space between your pictures, Jeff, and, and same, same with yours, um, Thomas, because one thing that's struck me, finally seeing your pictures, Thomas, in, in real life, and, and particularly, Jeff, with, with you, is, I mean, there are reams of pages written about this, but it's, it's about how you present your photographs, the, the scale, uh, um, the style, from the, the very small ones, of course, to those monumental, immersive light boxes, one of which I think no, I know is actually in, in the NGV as well. So, so tell me a bit about what actually interests you in, in, that, in that scale and presenting in that way. Me? Mm. Scale, I've um, always felt that um, life scale in pictures was a sort of a magic, has a sort of a magic about it. Um, I don't know whether it's easy to ex prove that or explain it. It just always felt that way to me even as a child. I think that's something that painting gave us over history. It's really the, the creation of painting. It's something we owe to painting since pre-Renaissance times. The idea that there's an image that appears on a wall and it's, it's in the same or similar scale to the world around it. And there's a certain kind of intimacy and magic about that that I was always drawn to. And I feel that it's become sort of a baseline for how I work. Um, I'd never wanted to make big photographs in the 80s and 70s and 80s when photographs started getting bigger and peering on walls, people thought, oh, all these guys are doing is making their photos big. But that's not really the case, at least I don't feel it's the case for me. Um, life scale is a, is a a magical point at which the world is either bigger than it or smaller than it. That's the threshold at which the whole pictorial world turns on that threshold. And so it's fascinating to stay near it. Talking about scale, Thomas, can you, can you respond to, to what Jeff is saying here? Because your works are also quite monumental in scale, although differently presented as well. What, what is it that interests you about that kind of presentation? Well. To, first of all, what you see on my photographs is basically a, a view into my studio. And um, the studio, what you see in the studio is something which is, you know, built for the, just for the sole purpose to be a photograph. But in that size, as I experience my real world. So everything you see is life size. In a sense, that's a documentation. And it seemed to be, at some point, you think, like, should I blow it up? Should I make it smaller or something? And I just didn't. I just wasn't sure what it means, in fact, to blow it up. You know, I can, of course, I make a small thing and I can blow it up, but I, I wouldn't know. It's very speculative. You make it very monumental, and you can talk about this. And I mean, there are people like Les Oldenburg who did that, and but I couldn't add anything to that. And so I thought, like the most, the most straightforward way of doing this, and like really knowing what you talk about, it would be if you, if the if the picture is more like a win window into into the studio like you just look at something like you would stand in front of a window in, to my studio and and in that of course it, me, it meets very old you know greek ideas of what the what the what the what a painting is a window to the world and so <clears throat> it seemed to be most unproblematic simply to do it that way so it's it's like really your photos are really of your empty studio <laughs> except it's not empty at the moment well, it's always something in there. And then yeah, but it <laughs> just happens to be something in there. Mm. But it's really the studio. It is just, it's most of the time in the studio. Mm -hmm. yeah, Are good. your photos of your studio as well? Gary Defoe was telling me earlier that, that he thought that might be the connection between you two as photographers. I think it's pretty fascinating that the way you put it, that it's actually just a view of your studio that happens to have something in it that you made at the time. Because um, it's very metaphysical when you put it that way. And so that's fascinating to me. And I must say, I hadn't thought about that before. I, I've made pictures that are, uh, I would call them studio pictures, which are always about there being, about there being a studio, about there being such a, a place or even an institution, if you want to call it that, called the studio. Um, but not as, not as consistently as Thomas, no, because I work, out, I, I work outside. I like to think also that there is something some air, some atmosphere of the studio that might actually persist mm -hmm. even when you're not in a studio. Why is that? 
I mean, I've been accused of, you know, my work being overly artificial and all this stuff about how it's not real photography and it's just, just kind, of, kind of total artifice. And it's, it's often meant as a criticism, but it's not really necessarily critical. Um, what, what, what you could call studio is state of mind also and a state of practice and a, an orientation to the world or to yourself. And then that doesn't have to be your address. It doesn't always have to be at your address. Your way of working could be portable and move to another so-called location. And I feel that sometimes there are pictures made in real places that have the feeling that that place has become this phantom imaginary place that is as if it might all almost be then it become a studio. Maybe that's also because both of us, although I'm older than Thomas, probably grew up in the e era of post-studio art, you know, where the idea that you didn't, this artist didn't necessarily need a studio anymore, or that the era of the studio was gone, and that we've, we've gone into something else. That didn't turn out to be the case, but it complicated it. It has to do, I think, if you, if you think the studio a little freer, which a friend of, our co a friend of us did, you know, it's about the intentionality. You can say the studio is something where you, it's a comp control environment, and of course then that, that environment doesn't need to be four walls, but it, it needs to be, it is about control if you want to put it negatively. If you want to put it positively, you say it's about the intention, a complete thorough intention of the thing, and that makes it different from a straightforward documentary as we know it in photography, like, you know, Walker Evans or something. So even if that's great art and everything, I just wouldn't kind of want to rule it out, but that's what Fried would kind of go it's for the is, the, of is the idea that we kind of, we completely know the intentionality is going through every little detail of the whole thing. And that doesn't mean pedantic, it means that we work like a painter with a picture pane and we just work on a, we just, we have to resolve these problems, you know, before we can, we actually get to a picture. I could, I think I can say that for you too. But then, you know, I also feel like uh, this so-called studio is also a place where really unforeseen things take, take place. Yeah, yeah, for me of anyway, course. a lot of accidents take place in that space. That's part of the way, at least I, I do my work. There's a lot of things that I, I can't predict. Things go wrong. Are those accidents, those, those, I suppose, little tiny mistakes along the way? Why does that make it more interesting for you, I suppose, a better process? Because I don't know who I am, and I don't know what I want, and I don't know what I should be doing, and I don't know what the <laughs> end point of something should be. Um, and That gives me so much relief, because <laughs> I think a lot of us can relate to this. <laughs> I think uh, what's interesting about art in general in any medium is that you can um, start something without having a, a plan. And, fin and finish it or not finish it, as the case may be, and those results will be a surprise. It's the same in any art form. Photography is no different, and it's no different no matter how you practice photography. Whether you are in the street in the classic sense of Cartier-Bresson, or whether you're in a so-called controlled environment, uh, the fundamental problems are always the same. That's why I don't feel there's any great distinction between what I do and what Gary Winogrand did. I think that that's, people felt there was a big difference at one time when, when tableau type photography began to emerge. People felt it was on the one hand this and on the other hand that. And I, I feel that most of the people who practiced, practiced in this mode uh, never felt that. Um, we might have been a bit polemical at some times and just making a little action for ourselves and saying things that we maybe overstated, but generally speaking, we didn't mean that. Um, and that the same problems persist no matter how you attack the medium. So um, for me, it's, it's a question of making sure that it's unpredictable. When was the last time you took a photograph that had no plan, as you say? Because when I see your images, I, I feel like I see such, such plan. But tell me, tell me something new. I don't know. Am I wrong? Well, the last one. <laughs> that's the last one. With it had the no iPhone. Plan. It had no plan. I never <laughs> have a plan. 
Never have a plan. I have a subject. That's all I have. It's just a starting point. Mm. Thomas, your, your subject, however, we're talking about the studio being elsewhere and the studio in our mind, but you very much do create things in your studio and, and as we can see in your works, they're, they're monumental and at the end of the day there, there is the photograph as well. But can we talk about the origins then, which is, which is in sculpture, because um, you create these life-sized environments. How, how did that start for you? Um, I just basically, I made things which I didn't want to wrap up. So I, I started as a sculptor. I know, I started as a painter. I made paintings, I had a feeling I can paint any, everything, but I didn't know what to paint. And I needed a, another problem, you know. So I just went to another school, I went to another context, and I thought like, okay, until I know why I would paint this and not that or something, I just kind of make sculptures. Because that's the furthest from what I ever did, and I just didn't have a clue what a sculpture is. Or, and so I made sculptures, which I, and then the next problem was that my, my, my apartment was actually just half the size of the stage. <clears throat> and it's very clear that if you make two sculptures, you know, one of them you have to store somewhere, whilst you'd make the second one. And what, what are you going to do? Then, that, you know, then kind of think about the future. In a year, you don't have a living room anymore. You have a storage, and you live in a storage. So I just wanted to solve the problem once, once for all. And then I... Also, kind of, I read, at the time I read the writings of Ed Reinhardt and he said, like, the sculptures are always the thing you stumble over when you want to have a decent view on a painting. And then the other thing is that you just kind of, you know, that I realized that most of the things I know, I know through pictures, like, from, of sculptures. And then you start reading, you start looking at photographs, it's like, how did they photograph? Some, some you know, Walter de Maria, for instance, if you study how he's photographed, it's very interesting that all of the photographs, as photographs, actually, they're not very... Um, artistic, but they're very artistic in the sense of they show you what the sculpture would be in the space. So you can experience the sculpture in the space through the photograph because the photogra photographer put his own ego to the background. He just knew that this is not what it's, what's at stake. So I kind of started reading photographs of sculptures in a different way than just kind of browsing through them. And <clears throat> and then, you know, and then I, at the same time I made these sculptures, I made them didn't have a clue about photography really like, and then I you used your dad's camera, didn't you? Is that right, when you started? No, I didn't know. It's basically, I made these sculptures, I threw them away, and I thought, like, I have an idea in my mind, and I can always, you know, when I have, ever have a show, I can, I just kind of think of some objects. I go to a, to a paper store, local paper store, I buy the stuff, and then the day later, I have the show. Very beautiful, travel-easy kind of concept. And, and then my professor at the time, fantastic professor, he basically after a year and a half or something, making all these things, never have more than 10 on the table because the table was that big. I just, he said like, look, at some point you just need to know whether you kind of actually make any progress with that or whether it's always, you know, the same in a different shape or something. <clears throat> and if you don't document it before you th throw them away, you will never know. Which I found really, I mean, everybody who wrote a text once in his life, and finds it five years later, will kind of probably find out that the text wasn't really as good as he thought it was, or the other way around. Because in a, as an idea, things have a totally different life than they have as a, as a real manifestation of it. And artists have to actually deal with that very often. So I thought, like, you know, he has a point. So I made a photograph of that sculpture, and the photograph looked so unbelievably... Uh, amateurish and like not everything I liked about the sculpture and everything I thought like that would resolve it very nicely wasn't on the photograph it looked like crammy and it looked bad and everything so I went to I, I thought like what shall, what shall I do I asked my professor and he said like I don't know you know just why, my, why don't you go to Bernd Becher upstairs on a Tuesday so I made an appointment I went to Bernd Becher I, I showed him the photograph I showed him the sculpture <clears throat> And I said, so I need to kind of learn photograph. You know, can you tell me how to do this and stuff? And he said, no, you need to have to do an apprenticeship. And that would take you three years in Germany and you would like, you know, schlep the coffer for the first year and then <laughs> next year you can kind of, you know, change the lamps or something like that. But it, it's just actually not what I wanted to do because the whole thing was about making, being flexible and fast and, you know, having an idea, go to the studio and make it immediately. And what I didn't know which was actually very funny. What I didn't know was, I, I might have told this before, and I know actually I have told this before, so for the people in, this, in the audience which have heard this before, pretend it's it. funny. So anyway, so... <laughs> Just make it good. It's, what I didn't know is that, maybe you knew, that, that Becher never had a, had, a, had a training either. It's his wife who had the training. 
I and so that. he yes, didn't say did that, that to kind of get me into three years apprenticeship. He d just plainly didn't know either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I just for a while I did I did kind of two sculptures, one for the photograph and one as a real sculpture. Kind of you know the photographic sculpture would be like something which kind of obeys basically to the to the to the crooked perspective, you know, and uh, you know the lens makes of something which is rectangular and then the photograph is of course distorted. And so I made these, and then, but then that was already the path away from the sculpture, a sculpture as a sculpture which needs to be documented, and, and you know. And, and when, when did the photograph become king for you, after you did your three years apprenticeship and, and carried the, the bags for a little while? But you didn't do that. Yeah, I know, I know, that. I'm just teasing. When, when, did the, when did the photograph become, become the artwork for you? What was that moment, that realisation? It's just more about problems, you know. It's just more like you have a problem and you just want to solve that problem, and then you realise that... The next, the next bigger step, I would say, was, which was important for me, I mean, it's all an evolutionary thing. You don't wake up in the middle of an idea in the morning and then you just, you know, like, oh, this would be a great strategy or something, like, you know. And so the next big kind of cliff I had to get around was I got I kind of muscled the problem of photographing one, one object. But then if you photograph two objects, it becomes a narrative. You know, any two objects next to each other, you just, the, the, the viewer tries to make sense of this. And so how do you muscle a narrative? What is the reason to be those two, photograph, uh, th those two objects to be found on one photograph? And, and that's, that got me somewhere else then. And <clears throat> but I still consider you know, this evolutionary phase. In every each of the works, I just kind of, I need to know why I'm doing this in a sense. I just need to have a sense what, why, you know, what it could be formal, it could be something which I can't forget or whatever. But then I want to see the sculpture. I don't want to make props. You know, I don't, they always have a backside. They always have a, they are objects in the space. And at some point, the photograph comes into play, but like actually like a week or two before I'm finished. Just, so, they, have a, they have a backside. Have Most a of them have a see. backside. Most of them have a backside, yeah. Uh -huh. they have you a can backside. walk around. The I just want them to see. be... Yeah. You build the side you don't see. Yeah, I want, to, I want them to be a, an object first, you know. Actually, it's not that I want them to be an object. I think like, you know, when you, when you look at architectural models, very often the architectural model is actually fantastic and the building it kind of represents is terrible. So there's something happening in, the, in between. And I think as an, as an object, this table here has a certain re realism about this. And if I would remake it and I make it too easy, then it becomes, or make it smaller or something like that, it, I can't take it serious as an object. And if I can't take this, this one serious as an object, I can't take whatever is on the, on the table serious as an object. And so there's a whole chain of, you know, be believability or decisions, you, you know, like the whole, you know your, your photographs are full of detail. And the detail is actually making this, it's a very specific space and not like any space, not a, any generic space. I don't think that there are details in photographs. I think that uh, it, there's no such, I, I think that when I was a, a young person and as a painter, um, and I, I love painting, and I could draw pretty well and all that, and at some point I deflected from being a painter, and I still, I'm still trying to find, ask, answer the question why that ever happened, and I don't really know, but I noticed that painting, really good painting of the last several centuries, the, probably the best painting of the past several centuries has a very specific relation to detail. It doesn't have very much detail. Velasquez, Cezanne, Manet, they don't have, they're not, they don't, you don't see a lot of fussy detail in them. And if you have an eye for detail, and I think I must have that sort of eye, you, you risk becoming a very bad painter because you'll get hung up on detail. And so that might be one of the reasons, but that's beside the point. What I, the main point is, there is no detail in photography, there's only focus. Because once there's a focal plane, given a certain resolution of the film and lens and so on, everything in it is sharp. Therefore, what's a detail? There is no detail. Everything is the same. So the word, There's the, so much detail in your work, though. We, the, the, the things that we're seeing is extremely detailed. But though, they're not Thomas. details. Mm. They're, the, they're effects of photography. Yeah, but, but not details. You, you're talking about photography right now, and I'm talking about the object. Mm -hmm. And so, if so I make a tabletop, and the, and the tabletop is like in relation to the leg, is like very generic. Basically, has for instance, it's like three centimeters and three centimeters. It doesn't look like a table, or, like we know a real table. It looks like a bad interpretation of a table. And that detail that this is different from this is actually, for me, it's a detail, but it's really important to make it 
no, a very specific object and not like just some object. So that's a construction problem, that's yeah. not a photographic thing. No, that's why I'm saying I'm just like, for me the objects have a lot of detail and so I need to get that right and if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not having this as an object which stands its own rights for instance, like they all kind of can, you know, they can do what the real thing can do as well, yeah. then I mean in terms of, you know, stability, not of course a, you know, like a, of course a lamp doesn't light or something. But. So most of the objects you've built where you see only the one face or the whatever, there's a back face complete. It's interesting. C could, you, could you put that in perspective for us? There's, there's one photograph in particular, um, and it's called Parliament, which we see just a particular image of, mm. of this work. But I have this imagining that there must have been a lot more to the actual structure, the object that you built for this as well. Just describe that picture for me and tell me a little bit about what you did. Well, that one is actually very photographic work in the sense that it, it's kind of, for me, it's a, for me, it's a, um, it's a long-term memory. The, uh, you know, like when you grow up, politics, when you grow up in Germany, politics were basically that Kohl gets elected as a chancellor. That's all about politics because that was for 18 years until I could, you know, it was hit the same chancellor. But the, the, the news about, the, about whatever has been dealt with in parliament was always in, an, in a parliament, in a West German parliament, which only had like three viewpoints. And one of them was actually really bad because you could only see, you know, you can see. so basically journalists always focused on two viewpoints. One was a general view and one was from the right. And they were so iconic that you just, you, only, you didn't need much to kind of identify this as a parliament to be, you know, like because it has exactly that overview from the top, from a certain kind of balcony in the back. And then you see a little, you know, a tele lens, a kind of a closer one from the right. And then you can see the, how do you call it? The, thing, you know, clear, clearer, and you have the parliament director behind it, the typical thing. It's interesting only because like the new parliament when the wall came down is a, is a new building built by Norman Foster and it has a lot of glass in, within an old like 19th century building. And so now suddenly you can see it from everywhere. Like you can see it from a top as a vi visitor, you look through the cupola onto the whole thing and like now view, they're, they're, they're like, a, you know, uncounted viewpoints which means that it never actually got an iconic view on that. So, and that is a weird thing because it represents, in a sense, it represents the ubiquity of like photography now, you know, whereas like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was, it was much more canonized and therefore got much more idealized as well. And so that, in that sense, the, the, the viewpoint on that photograph is very important. But basically that it's, you know, it's this kind of, it's a lantern and it's the, it's the building and, uh, you know, like in the, and the chairs and the chairs are built as chairs. There's nothing. But as you, as you say, these are, these are things that you grew up with. These are this interior view of the parliament or, or there's an example also of a picture of a, of a bathroom that we can see in the exhibition of a famous politician who died and, you know, the bath is empty. Of, of the body, of course, as well. These are all famous images from your memory, the things that you've, you've remembered. How, why is it that you, you source these images? How, how do they get ingrained in your mind? Well, you keep your eyes open. I don't, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, like I think, I mean, I started at some point, I just kind of started making things which I remember. And I thought, what, what if you can actually pull pictures out of your brain again, which is a stupid idea because if we, we don't have pictures in our brains. We have like, you know, connections in our brain. But this idea that you have like, you know, what would be a staircase? And then you have like, you, you think of five different staircases, like which, you know, would kind of exemplify a staircase for you. And one of them is the staircase of my school. So I would rebuild the staircase of my school. And then for some reason I thought like, I was in London and I didn't want to go and see the real one because that's not what it was about, you know. So it was about the staircase in my head. And you would rebuild that thing as meticulous as you can remember every detail, I hate to say, but like every little thing, like how did the doors look like? How did that look like? And I would leave out everything I can't remember. And that it becomes a thing on its own, you know. And so at some point I just realized it's not only that things I have seen myself because are my memories, but also like things which other people told me are my memories and especially other pictures people, you know, send over. Uh, like, and <clears throat> I wanted to work with those because then you open up a, it's not actually, you do, it's the opposite of opening, but it's like you close a tautological circle where you just say a paper is a paper is a paper or, you know, like uh, you make a picture of a picture of a picture and in the, in, in the, in the circle of remaking or reprivatizing a picture 
for yourself, you just make changes, of course, which where, where your experience of the world gets overimposed on the experience of the world the photographer had when he was making his original photograph. But not all of my photographs are made like that. So it's kind of, you know, they, they, some of them are, some of them are kind of actually based on experience. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say the pegboard, which is a white photograph with like lots of holes in it, you know, represents a story. There is no, it's the opposite of it. It's, I do like this quote that you said, um, you said you don't make things up, but you're an, you're an eccentric and naive mirror reflecting on what goes on around you. It's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> um, when listening to how Thomas um, responds to the world around him based on his memories, uh, sometimes it's based on images in, in the mass media as well. Some, some of your work, Jeff, has, has similar kind of ideas where there's fragments of memory in there too. Where, where do you source these kind of ideas from? I think that uh, for a long time, um, if you were supposed to be practicing photography, you were expected to find a motif in the world um, of, that, of the day, on the day you were out working, you were, you were, you were obliged or felt obliged to, to define that as the starting point. Something needed to occur in your presence and you needed to capture that occurrence with an apparatus. That's the classic notion of, a, of reportage. And it's, it's so true about photography that I think um, it became total. And when I was a young artist beginning to get interested in photography, I found that to be overwhelmingly true, so overwhelmingly true that it became a problem. And I think there was a lot of people probably my age, Thomas's age, who somehow uh, experienced that. And we're probably not the first people to have experienced it because it probably happened all the way through the history of photography. But we, we probably had some advantages. Um, we were probably lucky that um, one didn't have to get into the journalistic world to survive as a photographer. You could actually come at it from a different direction. And for whatever many reasons, uh, people who got interest, got, were interested in photography got freed from that or freed themselves from it. Um, and we could talk about all the reasons, but um, however that might be, the upshot of it, of it is that it's been, dis been proven, I suppose, and discovered that like all the other art, art forms, there is no known, given, and definitive starting point for making pictures in photography. Therefore, at, at, and, and, and once you get into that space, you realize, oh, something I heard, something I saw, something I read, something I dreamt, something I imagined becomes a starting point um, as no more than that, a starting point. And it can be systematized, it can become your regular way of working, or it cannot be. Uh, so it's unrestricted, essentially. I think, there's a, I think that uh, there was a long period of time when photography defined itself as art by being different from all the other arts. That's what it prided itself on. And that was the main thrust of the legitimation of photography up until the 70s, more or less, with exceptions. Uh, and that's began, like all orthodoxies, it began to fall apart. And um, um, that meant that um, it became much more interesting, and I remember this clearly myself, it became much more interesting to think about the similarities of photography to the other arts rather than the differences. The whole question of the differences by the time the mid 70s rolled around seemed to be kind of settled, at least for that period. They probably will come up again in a new way in the future, but that was, that was a settled question. Yes, we know photography is unique, fine. But it's also an art form that makes depictions, makes images, and therefore it must have kinship with sculpture, painting, drawing, and so on, because it's doing something akin. Therefore, if all these other art forms could have these starting points, then why couldn't photography? And of course, the other big influence in that was the cinema, which everyone grew up with, where films can be fantasy films, they can be realistic films, they can be unrealistic films, and so on and so on. And they can also be 
different films inside the same film. So that was a huge model for the, I think, for the freeing up of, of the origin, or the, the point of origin of how to make a photograph was um, the experience of the cinema. Mm. Thomas, what do you think? Because you actually do incorporate some film work in, in, in your work as well. In response to what Jeff is saying, how, what are your thoughts? Well, I had another advantage on top of what Jeff had, because he, Jeff, Jeff Wall, was in the world, you know, so I, you know, I could look at his work. That helped. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the... Um, Good point. The, the, you know, I can, I mean, in general, all the, whatever the picture means and whatever I can say is always what I can say, and I can always tell, tell, tell what I needed to make this work, and I'm happy to talk about that, but everything else is everything else. So what I say about the films has to do with my own idea of what the films are. It's never what they really are or whatever people see in that. I would just want to send this ahead because for me the films, like there was a, another point in history of photography was like when, when the digi digital got really, you know, got a foot in the door and everybody, there was suddenly a discussion and I got my, found myself in, the, in that discussion as a main ambassador for the new world by saying, you know, like, which says like about like the photography lies you know, what a thing, and it's ter terribly, and with the digital photography is dead. And then there were kind of a whole generation of people which were read as the proof of that thesis, which is of course nonsense. Photog photography is more life than it ever was. However, I didn't want to be part of that on one hand. On the other hand, if you're surrounded by a, by a reading of your own work, at some point you realize that you read it yourself like that and you don't want to be part of that. You know, I didn't ca kind of get into the whole thing I, ca I, came, I came into the world, whole world of photography as a dilettante and I just didn't want to be a, you know, a, basically I didn't want to be used in that sense and I didn't want to use my own work in that sense either. <clears throat> and I thought, so what I'm, what I'm actually doing, I should probably put more emphasis on what's in, in front of the camera because the camera itself is not so important for me. Whether, I mean, of course I would say probably there are differences between a di digital camera and an analog camera, but I didn't come from the camera. So I'm... For me, it's important what's in front of the whole thing, and I just would probably I have to kind of put more attention to what's in front of it. And for me, the, the idea of making a film would emphasize on the fact that it's a three-dimensional ent entity much more than just a picture pane, which might lie or might not lie. And in my case, of course, it lies completely. And so I thought, like, what would be the easiest way of doing that? I, and one would have been like, to show the, the, the object again, but that was way beyond, you know, just you got, you, I got on that you know, I got on the second floor, why did it kind of go, go down again? And so I thought like maybe if I, if I move the camera around and become a film, I'd like, you know, like it would probably kind of also let you see, see the still images in a different way, myself as well included. And then, you know, the easiest movement of a camera is just move through a space. And then I and kind of... we can actually walk through <coughs> your spaces as well. Your, your actual spaces are life-size. They're, they're quite gargantuan, yeah. aren't yeah, they? But I, I mean, that's another thing as I just kind of actually... You have to be... When, when everything is ready, you have to be very careful not to kind of trample down something, which you just kind of... Because it's fragile. You know, it's very fragile. And, but you also... You feel as a, as a person, you feel very light yourself. It's kind of actually a dream-like situation, which I only have myself. So I, I, I thought it would be quite interesting to kind of probably go look at this a little bit more... And then I did kind of move the camera through a space and I had an invitation by a museum at the time <coughs> to do a project and I just proposed I would like to do a film which kind of, you know, in the building obviously it's in most of my spaces are interior spaces because of the studio and other things. The camera would move through a space and the space would be built for the most natural kind of idea was like it would be built to be moved through which would be a street a car park, a tunnel, something like that. So I did propose to do a tunnel where your camera goes through and then we see where kind of whatever it will be. And then three months later, Lady Di had a terrible accident in a tunnel. And then I thought like, oh man, that's kind of doomed. You know, you can't do that. Or like, you know, we just had a problem. The museum and me, we were sitting together and thinking like, hmm, is that a little tasteless now? And then I thought, like, maybe it's like if, if everybody thinks about the tunnel now and only one tunnel, maybe you just have to, you know, kind of skip the idea of a tunnel. You just have to go for exactly that tunnel which comes up when everybody thinks about a tunnel. And then the whole project became a different thing and, you know, and then that became a film.
Mm. Um, Jeff, could we go back a bit and talk about one of your earlier images? Actually, I was talking to some a young guy before, and he was saying, what would Jeff Wall had done if he hadn't started, studied art history? What would he have taken pictures of originally? <laughs> what do you reckon about that question? Um, I don't know whether I even really did study art history. I was kind of an imposter as a, in, in art history. Um, when I was a little kid, uh, my parents had, I'm talking about the 1950s here, um, subscribed to um, um, art book publishers who sent every month a book about this or that famous artist, Goya, Rembrandt, and so on. And, they, and those were in, in our house from the time I was a little kid. And I was always drawn to them before I even knew what artists were. I, mean, I must have known what artists were because there they were, but I was drawn to them and drawn to the images and thought art, art was really something. And I always had the feeling as a little boy that I got, I got it, I got what art was. Um, and I never studied. I never really studied art history. All I ever did was, I didn't go to art school. Um, and I think I didn't go to art school because at the age of 17, I was so arrogant um, that I didn't think I needed to be taught by anybody. And I look back on that now being much older, feeling that, well, that's my fate. I did it. Um, I've never been in a classroom, and I've never had my work critiqued, never. Um, I've never done any of those things. When I, and so I was too arrogant, arrogant to go to art school. So I went to the university because, you know, it was what you did. And, um, and I studied in the art department because that's what I was interested in. But I never really studied art history. I just took the courses and did that because I was into it. Um, I don't think that's called studying art history. People say I'm an art historian. You know, I was never an art historian. Um, I went to the Courtauld Institute in London, um, and I got a fellowship to get a PhD at the Courtauld. And my advisor at the Courtauld was John Golding, who's a really good art historian. He wrote the, one of the great books on Cubism, and he was a very good painter. And I met him, and uh, probably the second or third time I met him, he, 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 he looked at me in a certain way, and he didn't say anything. And we made an agreement about what I was going to do there. And basically what he had told me without saying so was, I know you're not really an art historian. <laughs> you're really something else. An artist. You're an imposter. I don't <laughs> care. Um, I like you. We'll, we'll come to terms. And so I spent my time in London doing exactly what I wanted to do, anything I wanted to do. And it wasn't being an art historian. But I've, always, I've never believed that there is an art of the past. I think that art is always happening now. So if you go into the museum here and you see a Tang vase, it's not old, it's now. Everything's happening now. There is no old art. So, um, so I never studied art history, but for me, the art of the past is always alive. And the most alive thing about it is its quality, its goodness. That's the thing that I learned something from. So I, I would have made the same pictures. Sure. So talking about its quality and its goodness then, um, as an art imposter. Um, no, I'm not an imposter artist. I was an imposter art historian. <laughs> imposter art historian, thank you. Um, one, one of your earliest images then that's in this exhibition is from 1978 and, and it's, called, it's called The Destroyed Room and it does actually make reference um, to, to another work, a famous painting um, by Delacroix. Why, why did you reference that work? Can you remind us, tell, tell us about that story. Um, well, it's actually a photo of an empty studio that happens to have a construction in it, the way we were talking about before, and that's a much more inter interesting way of looking at it. Uh, it's a long story, but um, from the time I drifted away from painting via conceptual art and all that stuff, which I was very deeply involved in at the end of the 60s, um, until the middle of the 70s, I had a hard time understanding who I was and what sort of what I could do as an artist. I always wanted to be one. And I had done these sort of conceptual pieces in the late 60s, early 70s, and even was a bit successful at it. And by soon after, I looked at my work when I, when I was in London at the time, sort of, I was living in London, 
and had this sense of enormous humiliation at how feeble and, and pointless my work was. And I couldn't imagine going on doing that anymore. And I kind of cursed myself for abandoning my childhood affections. And then I really was at a loss. That really put me at a loss because I didn't know where to go. Um, and I had a very bad period as a, an artist um, for maybe five or six years, really lost, <coughs> desperate. I'd say I was a very desperate person. And, um, and my relationship to the art of the past, which in a way was the art of now, was complicated by my own failures. And um, when finally I managed to come back to being in a studio, and it's sort of all these things that led to doing the kind of pictures I do now happened, it was pretty um, exciting, and I was, I was really in a big hurry to get something done. And um, all the stuff that I sort of felt I'd failed at, um, all my bad vibes, um, all the things I feel I'd screwed up the previous years, dissatisfactions, but also all the excitements I had, you know, it all sort of came into focus in a few subjects. Uh, we're, they're like a little uh, valves that release energy. And that's what, the, say, this, the destroyed room was a, was a subject that came to me as a, as a kind of release of, um, you know, I guess, backed up energy. And then I, I made the picture rather quickly without thinking too much about it. And I thought, cool, uh, Delacroix, he's, he's interesting. He did this, he did that. Um, I had been thinking about that kind of art, so I just put it in there. It wasn't really to make a big erudite reference thing. It was just how I was. It's the kind of person I was. You know, I, I, I might have lived my own emotional life through wondering why Baudelaire did what he did or why Delacroix painted a certain painting that way. It's just how I thought. I still think that way. When you look at a picture like that, some of these early works, there's another one of yourself there, which there, there are two pictures of yourself in this one image as well. Big, big works. When you stand in front of it, what, what do you see today? I'm always judging my work and everyone else's all the time because I think that one of the things that art is about is judging. It's one of the great pleasures of art is judging its relative goodness. This piece, this work is better, a bit better than this one. Why? You know, you get two artists together or two interested people can have a long discussion about why one Thomas Damon is ever so slightly better than the other Thomas Damon. You know? <laughs> Thomas, your response to this one? Ever so They're slightly. All good. Ever so slightly. Not very different. Um, <laughs> And that, can go, that discussion can be very interesting. So the act of judgment is always going on, and it's a kind of a plague, plagues you. So, um, you know, some, some weeks or months or years, I, I judge a picture higher, and then it goes down and back and forth, because it's still alive for me. So I don't know. I'm, this destroyed room I'm kind of liking these days, because I feel like it is really the kind of person I was then. It seems real. It seems authentic to how I feel, I felt art should look at that time. So I'm up on it at the moment. How art should look at that time. What about how art should look today? How has your ideals or ideas shifted? I, I don't know that I can answer that. Um, I think, uh, you know, each picture you make has to look right at the moment you make it. And if you can't tell when it looks right, you're probably not going to make very much good work. Whatever that is, it's not scientific, so you can't, you'll never know. So you have to judge. Um, if I had a, if, if imaginarily that subject occurred to me now, would I make it differently? I, I really don't know. You know if you notice that the, the ceiling of the destroyed room is cardboard, um, and I made it out of cardboard at that time because I wanted it to be extremely false. I wanted to, the whole thing to be clearly as artificial and as fabricated and as unreal as possible. I was really into f people like Fassbinder at the time. He's always been one of my heroes because he made these films of such extravagant artifice um, and, and made them work. I, I always admired that and I still do. Um, so it may be that for that subject, that approach might still be the one, the best one. Hmm. 
Thomas, in, in, in reference to the idea of judging your work, how do you, how do you respond to Jeff's idea about, about this? Do you look at your work today and judge it differently perhaps than you would have in the past? No, but like I... Um, I do remember all the problems, you know. You look at the things and you just kind of... I do remember that for every each of these pictures, I kind of... It took me like day and night to find... Out I had like three or four which I, which I couldn't even tell the difference today anymore. But, you know, every now and then you have to kind of unwrap the old things and look for a scan or something like that. And I have like four of them next to me and it says original with a mistake, original with two mistakes, original with one mistake and a half, or some, some kind of way of like making sure that this is the one and not this one. And today I don't even see the difference anymore. And, but you know that it was a labor some thing and somehow like it meant everything. Either it's this, either you have this and everything is right, or you, if you take the, the, just the other one, it might, you, you might ruin the whole thing. And I just don't remember anymore what that was. But I do remember it was like they problematic and every each of them you go and you see them now like after like a, a year or like 10 years later you just kind of you can't remember why you just kind of bothered so much about it was totally clear that it has to be this one and not the other one you know and so it's more like that that you see these old friends and you know they kind of they okay they <laughs> they're old friends old friends Jeff in, in the <sighs> exhibition no I wouldn't put them in there now no. <laughs> some of them some of them are old nemesis <laughs> which which is the one work that's the the biggest nemesis then? I'm not gonna, I, just... No, I, I wouldn't answer that because each person has to look at a, a work for themselves and judge it for themselves. And if an artist tells you this piece is bad, that forecloses your experience of it. And so I don't think that would be a good thing to do, because I might hate a work of mine and consider it to be a curse upon me. Um, and something I'll have to atone for all my life. <laughs> um, but that's just my relationship to it. That doesn't mean it couldn't actually be good and give other people pleasure. So, um, so I shouldn't answer that. <laughs> um, talking on that note, though, um, Isabel Crombie, who introduced us, she, she wrote, Jeff, about your work that you reveal little of yourself and that your, you, your work is of a detached ob observer who brings incidents, gestures and stories to life. I Can think uh, my, my work is totally autobiographical. <laughs> oh, a bit of controversy. Um, that it's um, entirely about myself. Thomas? Well, people kind of, because sometimes I get the criticism that there's no people on my photographs. And I, I know, I'll, always say like, yeah, there's like only one person on it. It's everything is one person. It's me, 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 me everywhere, you know? <laughs> so. If there's one thing that I keep reading about, Thomas, with your work is how depressed people are that you chuck it out, that you put so much effort into creating these sculptures and that they're destroyed. Um, why do you think we're so focused on that, that idea? Well, one thing is like people, you know, like, and there are a couple of more things coming along with the th same bunch of questions. And one of them is like, it is so much work to do. It takes so long to do this. And then you throw it away or something. If I look at the Holbein, I don't know how long he painted on that. I don't even want to know. It doesn't matter. It's just like if, the, if he wouldn't have painted as long on it, I wouldn't be able to look at it. And with photography, you have this weird notion it has to be like a 60th of a second or something. But it's like, actually, I don't care. You know, like it's, it's, I, made, I make it as long as I need it to have the picture as I need it. And that's the one thing. The other thing is like, um, I just, I don't know, I, you know, I get more sentimental the older I get. So I, was, I kind of think like, how could I all throw all this away? But in a sense, it's also a very fresh beginning every time you just empty the studio and then you just have nothing to start with, which is really a relief. And you don't have to bother with the old stuff and kind of see it deteriorate because it's all fragile, you know? The third thing is like, that I should not have, it, one should not, except Jeff, but like in general, somebody should not have a wrong idea about how long the works live. Mm. You know, my work is a, is a, is a short occurrence in, in attention. It, you know, in five, 10 years, in 15 years or 50 years, it's, it's, it's you know, things are kind of written with a pencil, not with a, not with a waterproof pen. And so I think I just thought like, you know, I do what I do and I just kind of, I have to be clear about like photography is a fleeting 
probably a fleeting medium and it will be at some point, it will be there and it will be visible and then at some other point I have to give visibility to someone else. And I kind of, at the beginning when I started out with that whole thing, it seemed to be a very healthy thought. And but I, think all, I think all the, all the arts, and particularly the pictorial arts, are about vanishing, things that vanish. Everything that's pictured has vanished um, in, in one sort of way. Photography makes it a little bit more emphatic. Um, but you're capturing that moment that's vanished. Yeah, but only temporarily. Mm. I mean, if you, you know. I think it's um, important that everything that precedes the making of a picture vanishes into the picture. That once the picture has been made, everything else vanishes. Its past vanishes. In your case, it becomes very specific. The object vanishes. Um, to me, that's part of what a picture is, is the disappearance of everything that is not it. Not it. I must say, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you both. Would you please thank Jeff Wall and Thomas DeMann. Thank you. Thank you.